Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Professional Development Program presented by Teflin, Corwil Bali, Nusa Tenggara Barat, and Nusa Tenggara Timur in collaboration with Clarity English. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Harumi Manik Ayu Yamin from Teflin and Universitas Indonesia, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In this Welcome to our professional webinar, development program, we will have three speakers. Corwell Bali. They are Andrew Stokes, Adrian Ripper, and Made Heri Santosa. Andrew and Adrian will give their presentation together for 45 minutes, followed by Harry, who will also give a 45 minute presentation. After that, we will have approximately 20 minutes for the question and answer session. Before we begin the first presentation, I would like to inform you the rules of this webinar. Clarity, slides please. First, you are welcome to ask questions through YouTube live chat by using the hashtag ask, A-S-K. For instance, hashtag ask how to teach effectively using WhatsApp. Next. Please complete survey form after the webinar in order to receive webinar presentation slides and e-certificate. Next. The survey form is only accessible until 9 p.m. Jakarta time today. We will provide the link for you after the webinar. Next. The webinar presentation slides and the e-certificate will be emailed at the latest seven working days after the webinar. Okay, so those are the rules. Now we are going to start the first presentation. Before I hand this to the presenters, Andrew and Adrian, both from Clarity English, let me introduce them first. Andrew Stokes, MA, Kantap Dip Tefla, studied modern and medieval languages at Cambridge University and went on to gain teaching qualifications. He then taught English and French at schools and universities in the UK, Spain, and Malaysia, and spent several years with the British Council. Andrew is co-founder and managing director of Clarity English, where his particular interest is content design. He works with authors, curriculum, and testing experts, and partner organizations around the world to devise effective learning platforms. Additionally, he blogs, writes for the educational press, and speaks at international conferences. In this presentation, Andrew Stoke will present together with Adrian Ripper, PhD. Dr. Adrian Ripper has been studying, developing, and deploying artificial intelligence since his PhD at Southampton University, UK, in the 1980s. After lecturing at Southampton and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he worked as a programming manager in industry before switching to the field of education. He co-founded Clarity English, where he is now technical director. His role is to manage research and development, not just of the Clarity English programs themselves, but also the delivery and support systems. He is responsible for the successful implementation of millions of learning and testing sessions rolled out across the world each year. Adrian's current research topic is applying AI to the grading of writing tasks. Without further ado, please welcome Andrew and Adrian with their session, making digital resources work hard for our students. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Mary. Thank you. Are we? We're in vision now. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu uh, Mary, for your kind introduction. Thank you very much to Teflin for um, hosting us and for inviting us to give this talk. And welcome, welcome all. So this, this is our, our session, making digital resources work hard for our students. Um, let me introduce my colleague here. You are Adrian Raper, nice and, I am, and I am Andrew Stokes, uh, and we're gonna be putting, putting across some ideas over the next uh, 45 minutes. So we're sitting here in our office in, the Clarity English office in Hong Kong. Um, this is kind of, I expect some of you have been to Hong Kong. This is kind of, um, 
the typical opinion that people have of Hong Kong. Uh, we're not in this kind of really tense uh, middle bit of Hong Kong, we're out here. So uh, out in the east, eastern New Territories. This is a little bay near our, our office. Uh, there's a nice seafood restaurant in the middle of that, that picture there. Um, okay, so here is our team, Clarity English team. Um, but those of us who work in Hong Kong and those of us who are visiting, you'll, you'll see right in the middle of that picture, front and central, uh, Evida um, from Seleucy Educational Technology, who's been setting up this whole session, done a, done a great job. Um, some of you, I'm sure, I'm sure know her. Okay, so what is it looking like now in Hong Kong in general? Well, here's a photo I took earlier in the week. So you can see that we've got a couple of students there uh, masked up. Um, so we are kind of got to a stage where some schools are still closed, some are opening up, some are sort of half and half. So we have had a full school lockdown over the last probably about three months, would you say, Doctor? Mm -hmm. eight, eight or nine weeks. So every single student has been through, has engaged with remote learning and every single teacher has, um, has had to teach, has had to conduct classes online, just like um, I'm, I'm sure everybody who's watching this. So this is kind of a great opportunity to review that experience and to look at what works well, um, what works less well, and of course, some of the things that, that really don't work at all. So I, I want to start by saying that uh, remote teaching is, uh, is neither good nor bad. It's just different. Um, and it's really, really important that we approach this subject um, with an open and, and positive mind. Um, you know, it's been difficult for a lot of people. A lot of teachers have, of course, complained about it. Um, but there are also lots of great things that we've learned and lots of great things that we can do. And over the next 45 minutes, we're going to, um, we're going to explain six different ideas. And so, um, as in any good online class, I'd like to start with a, a learning objective. So what I, what I want each and every one of you to, to do is to um, choose just one of these ideas and see if you can put it into practice in your school, in your class, with your students um, at some point over the next two to three days. So we'll We'll number off these ideas as we go through them, and then we'll also have a list at the end. Okay, so in, in any situation uh, like this, like uh, remote teaching, uh, where we want to think about what we should do, sometimes it's also useful to think about what we shouldn't do, and that kind of throws, throws uh, an interesting light on the on the issue. So when this whole lockdown started, I was talking to um, a, a distributor of course books, of textbooks in Australia. And I was quite surprised that, I mean, they told me that the one thing that teachers are asking for is PDFs of their textbooks. So in other words, what they were trying to do was to take their classroom um, and everything they were doing in the classroom and to transfer that onto the internet. So I think the first thing we need to ask is, is this a reasonable approach? Is this a reasonable thing to do? Um, and I think, you know, we need, to, uh, we need to consider that some things are going to remain the same. Our essential pedagogy is not going to change. Um, we're going to, as teachers, we're going to give presentations, we're going to give activities to our students, we're going to have controlled practice, we're going to have uh, freer activities where they can really engage with the language. But other things really are going to be 
very, very different. Um, and I think this was perfectly illustrated by the questions that a few of you have already sent in prior, prior to this webinar. And the one thing that people really focused on was um, classroom management. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to talk about, the first four points actually, are going to be about classroom management. Now, um, let's start with the most basic thing of all, which is thinking about the platform that we're going to use. So I was um, lucky enough to talk to this, this teacher, um, Sam Lee, Miss Lee, primary teacher at uh, Stratford Hall in Canada. And actually she, she made a video for us about her experiences of, of different platforms, but um, unfortunately we didn't manage to play it through this system. So, so as with any decent uh, crime documentary, uh, I've got an actor to come in and uh, read her words for her. So um, welcome, Miss Lee. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, when we first um, moved to online teaching, we are using um, two, uh, two platforms and a lot of different tools. Um, after three weeks in, we realized that it was too much, too, uh, much too complicated. Our kids were confused, our parents were confused, and we, the teacher, were confused. And at this point, uh, we, we decided to adopt one platform and two to different, uh, two to two, three different um, tubes. And once we chosen the platform, we invest time um, to look into it and then to find out about how it works and all the features available. And we also make some short videos um, so that the students, the parents uh, can learn uh, how to use the feature that we usually use. It took a while for us to get there, um, but now um, our online teaching is more enjoyable and accessible. I understand um, it can be overwhelming uh, to start with, as there are so many great students out there um, for you to choose from. Uh, but once you know what fits your need, and I think it's really important for you um, to jump in and commit with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, that's really interesting, isn't it, Doctor? Yes, because there are so many tools, aren't there? The Zoom, Google Meets, Google Classrooms, Google Teams, uh, Microsoft yes. Teams. Microsoft Teams. So, you know, if you imagine that um, each teacher is using their own preferred uh, platform then it's very, very difficult for teachers to support each other, difficult for the school to support teachers. Um, it's difficult for the parents to help their children. Kids probably get on with it okay, but for the whole school community, it's much better to focus in on one tool. And of course, once you've one basic tool, right? Um, to rule them all. So uh, the, and once you've done that, um, the next thing, oops, the next thing we need to do is to look at um, the rules of behavior. So number one, idea number one is focusing in on the platform you're going to use. Number two is once you've chosen your platform, it's really important that um, everybody understands how they're going to, um, behave in this new online environment. And there are two reasons for this. So the first one is just the sheer practicality of it. So for example, it's very important that um, for students that when they're not talking, that they mute their microphone. Um, I was talking to a secondary school teacher here in Hong Kong, Ms. Kwok, and she was telling me that in one class, just one student didn't mute his microphone. And then suddenly there was an outburst of uh, his mother shouting in the background, his grandmother chopping vegetables in the kitchen. Everybody started laughing. And so just having that one student not muting their microphone suddenly um, upset the whole class. Um, and another thing, um, students really need to have their cameras on. You need to know that they're there. Let's have a look at this. I really like this uh, cartoon. So. This guy, 
are supposed to be working. He's switched off his camera and he's attached his mouse wire to his fan, which is moving backwards and forwards to make it look as though he's still there while he uh, goes out into the garden. So, you know, we need to see the face. So these are obvious practical rules, but equally there's a, a psychological side to it. Um, everybody needs to know that they are still at school, even if it's a virtual school. So, you know, as a teacher, you need to set yourself up for success. So you need to wear um, smart clothes, the kind of clothes that you normally wear at school. You need to have a clean, clear background for your camera. You need to have the camera at eye level. Uh, you don't want to um, be, you don't want the students looking down on the top of your head. Um, and there's, uh, I, I attended a meeting the other day and um, somebody was a bit late and he was in the car and he put his phone on and he put it on his lap. So it spent the whole time looking straight up his nose. So very unpleasant. <laughs> okay, so you want, to, you want to have a, you want to, you, you don't, that's very disrespectful, um, whether it's in a meeting or a class or whatever, yeah. So um, that's for the teacher. So you want to give of, give of your best, but equally for the students, all the same rules should apply. They can't be late. They need to wear the secondary, secondary school. They need to wear their school uniforms or, you know, decent clothes if they're, um, if they're at uh, university. Um, they shouldn't be in a cafe for class. They have to be at home. Um, they can't be on the bus. They can't be um, driving like your, your friend was. Um, if you have a student studying like this, then it simply undermines the learning atmosphere. Um, so there are lots and lots of rules like this. Um, basically, the things we've been discussing, we've got from talking to teachers, but there are some great best practice guidelines on the internet. There's a really good one from uh, Dartmouth College. And uh, so we put up a little website and then which will point you to at the end. And that's got links to um, some resources like this. OK, so that's the second idea, which is classroom um, management, again, which is about setting the rules and having a, a good fostering the best possible kind of teaching and learning environment. The next thing is about um, community. So um, online learning can seem, I mean, it is, it's remote by nature. Um, it can seem very cold, can't it, Doctor? It can be cold. It can feel lonely. You, you can think you are the only one there. I attended a Coursera um, course a, a year or so ago, and I was a student in it. And the lecturer would ask a question, and there must have been well over a hundred people there, but no one would type in something into the chat. I was trying to work out why. Um, and I think it's mostly, we didn't know each other. I had no idea who else was in the chat room. If I ask a question, you know, what, what is PTK? Do I look very stupid? Is my comment going to live forever in the chat? Whereas if we'd been in a physical classroom, that sort of uneasiness would never have happened. I, I'd have been sitting next to Andrew and I'd have bent over and said, PTK. And, and he'd have told me or it'd have been clear that nobody knew. O over the weeks, we'd have started chatting more, a bit social. And so this idea of a bit of chit chat before lessons um, is incredibly useful in developing a community, in sort of warming the feeling up. Um, now, one way you can do this in an online meeting, um, if we take a, a tool like Zoom, for example, is to use breakout rooms. Um, so if you're based on Zoom, if you've got a personal account like I have, um, then if you go into the website, uh, go into your account and click on settings, you'll find enable breakout rooms uh, somewhere in there. 
set that on. And that's something you only have to do once. Then next time you start a meeting, you'll see here, there'll be a new little button called breakout rooms. And you can set up rooms in different ways. And a, a way to achieve what we're talking about is five or 10 minutes before the class is scheduled to start, you can set up breakout rooms that will say have a maximum of six people. And then as people arrive, they'll randomly be put, put into a room until the room is filled up and then another room so that you get to start to chat to people. You know, uh, you know either a little chit chat or, you know, I wonder what we're going to learn today. Did you have a look at the video? Did you understand last week's? And this is going to build up. The breakout room lets you as the host jump in if you want to make sure people are chatting. You bring control back when you want. So you can also use it midway through uh, a lesson to get people to talk about an idea if you want to group activity. So that's a good way of building community, I think. Okay, so before the lesson, you you put people into, it's like people turning up early to a lecture, yeah. um, sitting next to each other, having a chat, could be what you do at the weekend, whatever. And yes. that, that is a way of building up the learning community. And that is a way of developing the human element of your learning community. And of course, breakout rooms are also good for a change of focus in mm -hmm. the lesson, aren't they? A change mm -hmm. of interaction. We when 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 we were at university, um, we would spend the whole day going to lectures, hour-long lectures, they were always an hour long, and you'd have someone um, at the front talking to you, droning on um, for an hour. Some of them were interesting, um, many of them weren't very interesting. And that's why you didn't go to any lectures. That's, right? that's one of the reasons I didn't yes. have uh, exemplary attendance. Yeah. And, um, but the thing is, even the ones that were interesting, it's very difficult to keep your attention for an hour. And that's why we don't we don't do that anymore in English language teaching. Yes, we, we, give, we present a concept, we give a presentation at the beginning, but then we put students into pairs, we have pair work, the pairs go into groups, we have group work. Um, we even might even get them to write something on this, this stuff. Ooh, um, and uh, so that, so, 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 that can be replicated um, using, fun can you use breakout rooms for pair work? Why not? Yes, you can control completely how many people go into a breakout room. Okay, so that's fine if you're using kind of one of the more high-end sophisticated tools like Zoom or uh, Teams. But supposing, um, supposing you're not, I mean, supposing you're using, supposing your primary tool is WhatsApp. How, how does it work in that case? And um, well, maybe the best way to do this is to let's set up a, a short example lesson um, in WhatsApp uh, to see what we how we can do it. Now, just as you were saying earlier, Andrew, set the ground rules, set the ground with some rules or prerequisites. And the first thing is it clearly you must have the WhatsApp contact of all the students in your class. And you need them to know that when you put them into a group, uh, you are share basically sharing their contact details with each other. Um, and this is something to, to keep in mind. Um, but then um, the next thing or the next good idea is to use the desktop version. Uh, it's so much easier if you, the teacher, are running this through your computer than on your phone. So how do you get WhatsApp onto your computer? So you, you can go to WhatsApp web uh, in your browser, um, and that will pull up a QR code like this. Um, and then you can pick up your phone, just take a uh, a snapshot of the QR code, and then that links your phone and the computer, and they're synced together. So then, 
the way that I like to do it is create a very simple Google Doc with the script of my lesson. So this is going to be all the things I want to type, the prompts, um, any resources I want to use. It's very simple for me to go through bit by bit. So let's have a look. So I start off with uh, setting the scene. So this is very clearly which class am I going to be? This is my English Communication 2GT class. It's a 15 minute lesson and it counts towards a coursework. So I can put this in the lesson before it's going to start. Then when it starts, I can go to my script. I can, ah, yes, one more rule I forgot to mention earlier. You need to be clear that you don't want students responding with, oh, thank yous, or good morning, or hi, bro, um, because that's going to completely disrupt your lesson flow. So the rule is that students do not put anything into the chat unless you specifically ask them to. So this lesson is going to be about text speak. You know that, right, Andrew? No. What's, what's, what's that, Roger? Well, lol, bro. Oh, right. <laughs> Internet talk. Internet talk. So um, maybe I want, so I will start by typing in the lesson objective into my WhatsApp chat, and that's going to be learning how to use text speak. Now, because I like the sound of my own voice, I'm going to start by recording uh, at the beginning. So that's obviously much easier on the phone. So I can start to record. Good morning. In this lesson, we're going to look at uh, when we can use text speak in our writing uh, and some more about examples of text speak so that we do it properly. I'm going to ask you a question and show you a video. So because the phone and the computer are linked up, as soon as I've saved that, as soon as I've stopped pressing the record button, it'll come up here. Students can listen to it. Then I can put in my question, which is, is it correct to use words spelt like internet speak? Or is that just bad English? I ask them to think, and then I'm going to ask them to watch a video, changing focus. Um, this is a YouTube video, so it's ever so easy just to paste a link into WhatsApp, and YouTube will take care of all the compressions so that the student gets the best experience on their phone or whatever. They watch the video. I can ask them a follow-up question, and then I want them to, to give them a worksheet. So I can create, uh, I've made another simple Google Doc. I export it as PDF, and then just drag and drop into my WhatsApp to put this in there. Can you um, just put any, sometimes I find it very difficult to read a PDF if, if it's on the phone. As you can see, this one I've made it very, very simple. It's quicker for me to do, and it looks, I mean, you can practically read it in the preview. Um, so if you if you keep it simple and export a PDF from Google, it'll go quite well. And you can also optimize for, is that right? You can optimize for the if, mobile. If you've got a, a much bigger PDF that you want someone to read, yes, you can, however you're creating it may have a obvious optimized for web yeah but for mobile mobile and then at the end it's important to make it clear that the lesson is finishing so i'm going to make another recording saying um in the worksheet you'll see lots of examples learn them follow the link to learn some more and then over the next few days i want everybody to add a comment to this chat which includes some text speak ideally respond to something that someone has just put 
so that then we're going to end up with a nice lesson full of examples from the students. Maybe I can give some feedback and they'll start responding to each other, maybe even a real conversation. So our WhatsApp lesson has used many changes of focus, videos, encouraging responses, and it's been very simple for me to run. Okay, that's great. So, you know, we can change focus in, in different ways. Um, if we're on something like Zoom, then we can have um, presentations, we can have um, group work, we can have pair work, we can have whole class feedback, um, observing the, 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 the microphone rules and everything. But if we're not on um, Zoom or, or, or one of these platforms, then we can have different media. And of course, uh, students interact in different ways with different media. So they're listening to, to what you're saying, they're reading, they're watching a video. So they're practicing their listening skills with that. I suppose, you know, you could also ask them to record uh, audio and to, to post that as well, so. Yeah, very much. And there's lots of lesson ideas for using WhatsApp. Um, Professor Abdul Karim Alias from University of Science Malaysia has a YouTube channel with excellent ideas. Great, okay, some really, really good stuff on YouTube, isn't it, to, to search for it. Okay, so um, that's great. So let's have a, a quick summary, a recap of what we've done so far on classroom management. So we started off by um, just coming up with this experience from Canada that using multiple platforms makes life a lot more difficult for everyone and that choosing one platform or one set of tools uh, and sticking to it um, is much much more efficient and more effective and makes you feel much more comfortable with what you're doing. Then of course, you know, it's kind of common sense this, but it's easily forgotten. Like um, Adrian's friend who attended a conference with his, while driving with his phone in his lap. He would never consider behaving like that in real life. But somehow, because it's remote, um, it, it, it might not occur to you. So we do need to make these things explicit, the rules of behavior. Okay, thirdly, um, this idea of, although learning is remote, um, trying to maintain and foster the, the human element um, and to build the learning community. And finally, we looked at the change of focus and the change of interaction. Now, of course, part of the change of focus is going to be independent learning. So independent learning is something, I mean, something that we, we all encourage our students to do. Now, I want to relate independent learning to mixed ability classes because I, I think this, um, what, we, what we're going through at the moment, this remote learning, is a great opportunity for us to explore what we do with mixed ability classes and perhaps learn some things that we can take back into the classroom when we all go back um, in the next few weeks. So, it, typically, I mean, I think particularly particularly at university level, more so than at secondary level, where teachers are thrown into a, a class where they have perhaps, you know, a, a load of students um, at upper kind of A2, CFR, A2 level, perhaps a big bunch of them at B1, and you might have one or two of them at, at, at C1. So how do we cope with these students? Well, it, it gives us a great opportunity for um, to hone our skills in differentiation and um, what we're doing now. But we can only do that if we really know where our students are. So what I'd like to talk about um, first is the key element in helping our learners succeed, um, which is placement testing. So um, I want to put this in the context of a study that was done in community colleges in America. Um, I was gonna write the title up here, but it's a bit long, so I'll, I'll just read it out. So it's called English Proficiency, Course Patterns and Academic Achievements of Limited English Proficient Community College Students. 
You could never have typed that. I don't think I could have spelled that all. Yeah. So there's a QR, there's a QR code there. So uh, you know, um, it's a real page turner. So um, click into it and take a look. So what it aimed to find out was what are the elements that really influence whether a student reaches their language goal. So in this case, the language goal was defined as reaching a B2 level in the CFR scale. So let's look at um, some of the results. So first of all, what happens if a student gets no support at all? So if a student gets no support at all, they go one in 12 to an 8% chance of reaching their language goal. Not, not very good at all. Now this jumps quite a bit if they get initial support. So what does that mean? Well, that means maybe um, an induction course, an orientation course, perhaps a, a tour of the self-access centre or the library. Um, and then it jumps up to 29%. So if they know what's there, they've got a better chance of succeeding. Now, if they get, of course, this is in America, so there's plenty of native speakers around. So if they get support from a native speaker, then it jumps to 43%. Of course, we know that um, just because you're a native speaker doesn't mean that you can teach the language. So if you have a proper teacher, a properly trained teacher, then this jumps up to 62%. But here's a really impressive statistic, Doctor. 81%. So if a student's level is correctly diagnosed and they're given the appropriate learning materials for that level, then they have an 81% chance of achieving their learning, their language learning goals. That is really quite extraordinary, isn't it? Big jump. So it's I mean, it's a huge jump from 8% to 81%, but it's also logical in a way, isn't it? Because if you're on a journey, um, a language learning journey or any other kind of journey, well, then you need to learn, you need to know two things. You need to know your destination, in this case, your B2. You need to know your destination, but you also need to know where you are now. You need to know your starting point. So if somebody, phones me up and says, how do I get to Jakarta Airport? Then obviously the very first question I'm going to ask is, well, where are you now? So equally, if we're going to help our students to reach their language learning goals, we need to know where they are now. And once we know where they are, then um, what can we do? We can start to cross-reference them with the language learning resources that we have available in our centre. So let's take a look at how we can do that. So I'm going to, so I want you to think about your language syllabus, or if you don't have a, I mean, you, you know, it, some, some, um, some courses don't even have syllabuses, they just have a, a, an, an exit test um, for English language to go with whatever other subject the students are learning. But let's assume there's a syllabus taking them through to an exit test. So I'm showing you part of a syllabus here, but I want you to think about your own syllabus and let's think about it in terms of that. So, um, what we're looking at here is the outcome of a project that a really fantastic project that was done in the UK. It started in 1999. I think it went through to about 2007. It was called ESOL Skills for Life. So what they did was they asked thousands and thousands of people um, the kind of language skills they needed or they felt they needed in English for school um, and for, for, for life for work and for life, so for work and for life. And then they um, uh, tabulated all of these language skills um, from A1 in the CEFR scale all the way through to C2. Um, so what we're looking at now is um, the reading element, and we're looking at the A2 level of the reading element. So what I wanted to do is just look at one or two goals, or in fact, one specific goal 
And in your mind, I want you to think of one specific goal in your syllabus. So, um, Doctor, could you? So this is so the main learning outcome uh, that we're looking at here is it's being able to locate information in written sources. Okay, locating information in written sources, and then that's broken down a little bit further, highlighted there. The first bit, to obtain information from short, everyday information texts. Okay, so obtaining information from short, everyday information texts. And I think there's another column on another page which breaks it down further and um, talks about um, scanning. Okay, so we've got our objective, our learning objective, or in this case it's called an assessment criteria, criterion, we have that in mind. So now we need to think about the learning resources that we have in our centre that we can cross-reference with that. So I'm going to look at it in terms of um, a programme called Active Reading, which we publish. It's a, an interactive online um, reading programme at six levels. Um, we're looking at the part of the syllabus for the elementary level, which is A2, which matches with our assessment criteria here. We're just looking at the description for one unit. So if you can... So this is the unit 10, and it says that the reading focus is standard. Okay, so that sounds promising. Okay. Then the text types are email inbox, food label, and bank statement. Okay, so if we're comparing obtaining information from short texts, that sounds good. If we're talking about short everyday information texts, that sounds as though we could look a bit further. Mm -hmm. So let's go into the resource itself. That's the next, when you've got something that looks promising, then the next step is to look at the thing itself. So, okay, I've just got a few screenshots here. So, okay, so we start off by listening to the teacher. So he's describing what is scanning. Um, he's describing how to scan. And he's talking about the kind of text that you might want to scan. So it still sounds promising. So let's look at a couple of exercises. Okay, here we've got a, an email inbox. So we've got three columns of the inbox. We've got some questions on the other side of the screen. Okay, and we have to scan through um, the from column, the date, um, and the subject to find specific emails. Okay, then, okay, this one, another short everyday text. So this is a food label. So what, why would you want to scan a food label? Well, let's say um, my child is going to bring home some friends uh, after school today, uh, and I've been told that um, one of them has a nut allergy or gluten intolerance. I need to be able to scan the food labels that I'm going to serve to make sure that I am um, not cheating. Oh, right. Okay. So that, so that very definitely is an everyday text, isn't it? Yes. An everyday information text. Okay. And finally, we have this one, which is a bank statement. So the, the exercise is to, it's a nice exercise, actually. It's got um, somebody, it's simulating somebody on the phone calling you, asking you to scan through for specific information on payments that have been made, how much they were for, and um, how much is left in the account. I'm sure we've all, we've, all, we've all done that. So, okay, so what we've done is, we first of all, we've found the level of the students. Then we've looked at the, um, the learning objectives at, um, at the output level, the, the outcome level that we need. Then once we've got those learning objectives, we've cross-referenced those with um, the materials that we have in the centre. We're looking at active reading. Those materials might be a book, might be a magazine, um, could be a video, could be an audio programme, radio programme, could, could, be, could be any sort of um, independent learning, self-access activity. Now, obviously, this cross-referencing is not a small job. It's a time-consuming job. It's not something that has to be done all at the same time. This is something that can be done step by step, even if you did one a week. That's, uh, that's progress. 
it's definitely not something that should be done by one person. This is a task that should be split across the department. I mean, part of the objective of this is that everybody in the department gets to know the resources that are available so they can recommend them to their students. Okay, let's move on, let's sum up. So to sum up, um, perhaps you could talk us through this photo. Well, this, this, this is what we're all looking forward to seeing again, I think, a physical classroom full of students, um, but yet they all on their devices, they're all taking the best out of digital learning um, that we've learned over the last few months. Yeah, so this, this photo is actually at Andalas University in Western Sumatra. Um, and all these students are actually, they're doing a, a, an adaptive test on their mobile. So kind of perfect, isn't it? Mm. Um, the, the software is adapting to their level in exactly the way that we've been describing. Excuse me. Okay, so at the beginning, um, I suggested that uh, we were going to go through six different ideas and that um, the task to come out of this part of the session was to choose one of these ideas and see if you can put it into practice in your learning situation over the next two to three days or you know, by the end of the week. So um, we'll just review them one more time. So. The first one was, I think, you know, obviously you're not going to choose a new platform for your school in the next two to three days, but it's definitely worth reviewing that situation and putting some thought into um, how you can optimize the situation that you're in. Uh, the second one was about the rules, uh, establishing how you're going to manage all these things. Yeah, yes, and one thing that I forgot to say before was that obviously it's important that the students are all aware of these rules. So, you know, if and when this happens again, you might want to make the first class um, all about the rules, the rules of engagement, right? Um, and then each succeeding term or semester, you might want to have a refreshment class. <coughs> okay, the next one is. Again, thinking about how you're going to develop the learning, the human, all the human aspects of the learning community. And the idea we put forward, or the doctor put forward, was to have um, a little breakout session, putting students together at the beginning of a class. Lots of chatting, chat, 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 that's all you want. The fourth idea was um, to try and sort of look at the ch using change of focus in the lesson. So it wasn't one that hour long dry presentation, but the sort of dynamic lessons that we like to teach you class in. Great. Okay. Um, next one is the, the critical importance of testing your students level so that you can differentiate effectively um, and give each learner the best possible chance of reaching their language learning objective. And finally, we looked at um, cross referencing the materials you have available. Uh, to the syllabus to make sure that, especially in mixed ability classes, you can deliver the most appropriate materials to the students. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So I, I said earlier on that we've set up a, a website, um, www.clarityenglish.com slash Teflin. There are some um, active reading is up there. You can um, use it as much as you like. It's going to be up there till the end of the month. Also, the links that I spoke about seems to have lost sound. Okay, and um, we've almost finished, so we'll just carry on. Uh, so Adrian's email is up there. My email is up there. Please feel free to email us with any questions, suggestions, ideas, thoughts. So finally, we'd both like to say um, a huge thank you to Teflin for kindly inviting us, to um, Ibu Cecilia for um, arranging this whole thing, uh, Umemi for being such a superb moderator. Very much looking forward to Pat Harry's session after this. So it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Bye. Bye.
Okay, thank you very much uh, for the remarkable presentation, uh, Dr. Adrian Ripper, uh, Ripper and Andrew Stokes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the next presentation. Here we have another presenter, Madeheri Santosa, PhD. Before we listen to his presentation, Revisiting Meaningful Learning Using Technologies in Emergency Remote Teaching, let me introduce him first. Made Heri Santosa is a lecturer researcher at Ganesha State University of Education, Bali, Indonesia. His works have been published in several publications, including Nova Science Publishers, Journal on English as a Foreign Language, Journal of Educational Technology, Journal of English Education and Linguistic Studies, and many others. He is also a journal reviewer of some, including TESOL Journal. He has been extensively speaking in various TESOL forums, like TESOL Convention, Asia TAFL, Camp TESOL, TAFLIN, and workshops for Indonesian teachers and headmasters. He serves as head of Online Learning Center, director of program in Indonesia Technology Enhanced Language Learning Association, and the leading trainer in British Council Indonesia. His main research interests include EFL, Cal, e-learning, innovative pedagogies, learning technologies, learner autonomy, translanguaging, and learning approaches. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Made Heri Santosa. Thank you very much, um, Mamemi, for a very nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all the presenters and also uh, participants from um, many parts of the world. Uh, in fact, we actually uh, intend this to have uh, participants from Bali, East Nusa Tenggara and West Nusa Tenggara, but we have now several from even Borneo, Jakarta, Maluku, or some of my students there, Momere and the Ambon, Sulawesi, and even from Nepal and other parts. So thank you very much for this. Um, thank you also for Ibu Cecilia from Teflin, uh, Mbak Memi, Ibu Seri Malini, Mela, and Santi from Teflin Bali, and also Ibu Ervida and uh, other people from Clarity. I would like to share my thoughts now and let's learn together. Uh, right, so my topic today will be about more how to blend everything together uh, all technologies, pedagogies, and also the understanding of the subject matter into uh, achieving what is called effective or flexible or meaningful learning, whatever you call it. So my topic today will talk about meaningful learning using tools in a particular context called emergency remote teaching. My name is Made Heri Santosa. You can call me Harry or Made. I'm from Universitas Pendidikan Ganesha, or Ganesha University of Education from North Bali. This is my email. So if you want to talk more later on, you can contact me. How are you all, everyone? You can answer this in uh, our streaming, uh, of course. This kind of question is very important. And please ask yourself whether you have also do the same to your students because mental health, well-being, is very also, uh, important to, to check, yeah? I hope that everyone is well today and let's uh, learn together here. Today, I'm going to share and learn together with you several important points. The first one, I would like to talk about today's changing situation. Some of the ideas and thoughts have been presented by Adrian and Andrew very nice and remarkable presentation just now. And today I'm going to try to give some emphasis probably or touch different parts from a particular situation like Indonesia and similar context. The second topic that I'm going to share today is how actually you as teachers and educators must possess and acquire pedagogical skills and also competencies in the online learning context. Because teaching online and teaching face-to-face -face will be different. The third one is how actually you integrate everything using technology-mediated instruction and also uh, other subject matter expertise of content and then to achieve meaningful learning. 
And last, I would like to summarize everything. So as presented by Adrian and Andrew just now, well, we know what happened today, but I would like to share some uh, pictures from you, uh, to you. So learning before COVID in an Indonesian context, especially still uh, went from uh, this type of situation. Students are still learning from in, inside classroom. So uh, in some parts of Indonesia, including Bali, they even learn from this kind of class. So it is still inside a, a wall, a, a, a building wall, yeah? And then our educational system is directed into uh, helping and equipping our students to take more roles and soft skills in the global context. So if I give you some illustrations, our education before COVID is directed to uh, the cognitive side and also soft, soft skill side, so core skill side. For example, uh, giving illustration how AT&T, a uh, telecommunication company in the US and using Indonesian context like Telkom and Telkom Cell, uh, it was successful to disrupt themselves into uh, something new to adapt into change or disruption. So for example, Telkom in Indonesia, in the past, it was just a, a landline uh, company, but then since the emergence of cellular uh, technology, Telkom uh, was successful to have a branch uh, called Telkom Cell, focusing mainly on cellular communication and it is running well uh, today. You know the story of Nokia, for example, Nokia, where is Nokia today? Uh, even though there are so many uh, production before, it has been like uh, so many years um, yeah, on the top of the selling and so on. But now there is no Nokia because you know what happens, right? No innovation, for example. This is also the same with Kodak, but a different story to Fuji, a two photography company. Kodak was not successful to adapt itself, but Fujifilm can adapt into health and healthcare companies type of thing. So it happens the same also with Uber, Gojek, Grab, and Bluebird in our context, and of, on FinTech also like OFO. So our education before this is more directed into preparing our students to equip themselves with skills to participate in the global context. And also one more thing, uh, our students are introduced with this. Uh, the first artificial in intelligence powered social humanity robot called Sophia. You can search the YouTube and uh, probably check how uh, she can speak and interact with you very well. So it is more about disruption before COVID. Yeah, it is still there, but what happens today? Many stalls, warung are closed because of COVID. In Bali, for example, the beach are closes, uh, closed because of this uh, pandemic. Uh, parents are forced to work from home. Even they have to take care of their babies, do babysitting, for example. Our students also are forced to study from home. Uh, still, we have the issue of global uh, advancement like industrial revolution with artificial intelligence and so on. In Indonesian context, we have two big policies at the moment. First, in the school levels, uh, where we have Merdeka Belajar or a freedom to learn, uh, basically giving more opportunity, opportunities to our students and teachers to have, for example, only one page lesson plan to be more creative and so on and so on. In the higher educational context, uh, there is also a policy, a changing policy called Campus Merdeka, which is basically about independent institutional type of policy where campuses, higher education are allowed to uh, rest restruct their, uh, restructure their uh, curriculum, for example. They can buy courses, they can sell also uh, in a quotation mark courses uh, to other students out, even outside their department or outside the university. Uh, accreditation is also changing. But just suddenly we have this kind of thing called COVID, which is a pandemic. 
So it disrupts everything, not only about industrial revolution, but everything is changing. So we are forced to change our way of living. And in the educational context, we are forced to change our way of learning or studying. If I'm using Vulan uh, et al. Uh, diagram, it is called new learning process, where we learn, we play, we produce our research at the same time now, even much more than before COVID. So what happens to our teacher today? I used to give this kind of illustrations too. In some contexts, especially in Indonesia, our teachers work very hard from planning, in, uh, teaching, assessing, preparing everything until midnight, isn't it? Then we have to work on administrative stuffs like certification. So you can go, get more money because of the salary is not that high here. Sometimes you also do online taxes after teaching and so on and so on. So what happens to our students today? Our students work from home or study from home in some places, they even have to help their parents, like, you know, selling things in the market, or even they uh, cannot continue their education. Like last week, I got a WhatsApp from my student and mentioning that she couldn't continue next semester. This makes me very sad, actually, and I'm trying to help. So things like this happen. And in a way, our students got stressed, confused, and so on and so on. We are forced to use a lot of platforms never imagined before. It has been there before, but we never use it uh, as much as today. Uh, I, I remember the first time uh, I was asked to teach some of the colleagues to use Zoom and Meet, for example, and WebEx. So, and also Teams, Microsoft Teams. If you like to use Lark or Teamlink or Jitsi, an open source, and for synchronous also, it's okay. Or Facebook video or Telegram. Or if you like to play games, you can use Discord, something similar to WhatsApp, but you can have a, a different groups there, okay? We are forced even more to use this kind of platforms, apps, and technological tools. They have been there uh, all around, they are available, but we are not using it as much as today. The question is then, everything some, some, uh, becomes uh, online, so, before this, we normally blend or, or make it hybrid, face-to-face -face and online. But now we, we do it online. We work from home. Uh, either synchronous, asynchronous, but every, everything is distant, not at the same building or wall. Everything comes very suddenly, very abrupt. We are asked to shift ourselves, even to disrupt ourselves. We are unprepared. Some of us got confused and overwhelmed, all right? So what we have today is not a normal online teaching. What we have today is called emergency remote teaching, where it is a temporary situation where you deliver your instruction and teaching learning process beyond the classroom wall due to crisis. For example, war, conflict, or like today, pandemic. So, there is a joke for this actually. Uh, for so many years, I'm trying to ask many of my colleagues, teachers and so on to you know, utilize more technologies in, in their classroom, but nothing can change us as fast as Corona. So this is interesting. Now, luckily we adapt ourselves quite well. We attend webinar like today, so many already now. Uh, and probably the materials are, are cross, uh, crossing to each other. We attend uh, online courses also. And even we know how to do streaming using OBS, for example. Yeah, never imagine, right? Now, <clears throat> we adapt ourselves. The question is how long and how ready we are. So in Indone Indonesian context, there was already a policy from four ministers uh, last week that we are going to continue this kind of situation until the end of the year meaning that us educators, uh, students, and even parents need to prepare more, yeah? You can watch the video of the policy here in higher education context in Indonesia, uh, the Ministry of Education already prepare free online courses on different theme and topics that you can access from this link. Later, I will share the material. 
You can also attend some seminar uh, on different topics here also in this link from SPADA. Right, now let's listen stories from teachers and students. Our teachers mainly uh, mentioning or express that they are using already different tools like Zoom, Meet, WhatsApp, Padlet, and so on. They miss their students. They miss interactions with their students. In a way, they feel that so many loads that they have to do at the same time from preparing, they have to learn about online things, uh, making their own materials or searching for materials and so on and so on. And this is interesting. If you already uh, attend webinar for several times, you can see this kind of question. Even in YouTube just now, I already see this kind of question like, can I get a certificate for this? And you link to the slides, any present list. Well, probably this is typical to us. Yeah, I don't know to other contexts. From students' perspective, this is what happens. So they use different tools from their teachers. Uh, they miss their friends. The assignments are too many. And where is the feedback? So these are the issues in today's changing learning situation. How to cope with this? First, you have to understand that online learning and face-to-face -face classroom are different. The space is different. In online, it is beyond classroom wall. In face-to-face, -face, it is inside the wall, okay? The presence uh, in a way are different. In online, it, it is even much difficult, more difficult. You have to have psychological presence, physical presence, spiritual, and also emotional presence at the same time. The interaction must be there. You cannot leave the students. Motivation are different. Our students, some of the chats just now in YouTube mentioned that my students are lazy. How can I nurture and drive their motivation to do tasks, for example? The engagement are different. Even in the classroom, it is uh, easier in a way, I don't know, because you can see them, there is a facial expression, eye contact and so on. But if you manage things quite well, then you know how to engage your students. And the last one is the feedback is also different. Everything is online. You have to check one by one and so on. Especially if you have big class like I have, I teach normally every semester around 300 students from undergraduate masters and doctoral level, not to mention doing other tasks also from the institution. But with the use of technology, we can try our best to deal with this. When teaching online, you have to understand and equip yourself with the concepts of pedagogies, online pedagogies to be particular. First, Online learning is not digitizing the materials. And Adrian and Andrew already uh, talked about this. So you just don't put or move PDF, for example, 200 pages ebook into your learning management system or WhatsApp group. It must have effective strategies and activates the student's active learning or student-centered learning type of thing. You have to concern about interactivity and presence there. And the task load must be relevant. Yeah, I cannot talk a lot. Uh, I can talk a lot about this, but because of the time, the idea of load is that you have to make uh, the learning flowing, not too, too difficult, not too easy. So if you use flow theory, for example, or cognitive load theory, for example, you know how to deal with this. Now, you know the concepts of pedagogy already. Next, when you teach online, you have to have particular important competencies or skills because without this, you cannot make the online learning meaningful. You just digitize or put everything online without making meaning of the materials and media use, for example. First, what you have to have is the skill to design online course. Designing online, online course means that your topic must flowing and scaffolding, scaffolded, I mean, uh, in a smooth way, yeah? Uh, and the load also is not jumping. So for example, it is too easy and then too difficult. So it must be flowing. You have to have the skill of verbal and non-verbal. In online context, non-verbal is, uh, is not easy. Sometimes in WhatsApp, I also use WhatsApp now, 
Before this, I'd never use WhatsApp because of the internet connection and so on. Sometimes when we talk something, because we don't see the face, it can be interpreted differently. So you have to have the skill of nonverbal from, for example, using emojis or other ways, okay? You have to be expert in your subject matter with the content of your lesson. You have to know how to vary and design uh, rich, meaningful activities. You have to have the questioning skill. It is not easy to question our students to, to drive them, for example, to participate. It is not only about yes or no, a low order type of thinking uh, question, but also you can drive slowly into uh, making them think and giving them opportunities to uh, make learning for themselves personalized and meaningful. You have to think of engagement. And of course, if you use a uh, learning management uh, system, for example, like Moodle, Canvas, or Schoology, or Blackboard, you have to know how to design visually with colors, with navigation, user-friendly type of thing, and so on. Right. Don't forget this, tools, uh, this thing also called not netiquette. This can work uh, very good with uh, teaching characters also. Some questions from my experience giving webinar before this, the question of characters, soft skills are this, uh, and using netiquette at the beginning of the lesson is important, one of them to address uh, characters. There are so many other ways that I will demonstrate later on after this. So these are only some examples. You can copy this one or you can have your own personal uh, netiquettes. So the key to this uh, meaningful learning is to revisit your pedagogy. First, as Andrew uh, and Adrian mentioned just now, use learning objective. Learning objective is like a map for treasure. If you are a researcher, this is like research question. So when you are lost, go back to your learning objective. This will guide you. Second, once you understand your learning objective, you will start thinking what media and materials that I, I can use and relevant to help the students to achieve the learning objective, whether it is audiovisual, multimodal, or multi-channels. Next, you start thinking what kind of activities should I do to help my students achieve the learning objective, whether it is only brainstorming and when and where, uh, whether it is think, pair, share activity, whether it is small group discussion, whether it is whole class group discussion, rotation station and so on. So you know when and where you can implement different and rich activities. And don't forget assessment, whether it is formative, summative or reflective, all right? So assessment for learning, assessment of learning, and assessment as learning. So let me model and give you example, a simple one, because this is not a workshop. So I just give a simple one on, on how you deal with all those things and integrate them nicely and elegantly into a simple lesson plan or a model of learning. Uh, I normally start my question, uh, my, my, my class with this kind of question. So uh, normally I use an old lady, young lady, and this acts the same. I can ask my students, what do you see? Some of them will uh, mention a duck. Some of them probably mention a rabbit. So, and probably other things, for example, a, a crescent moon here and so on and so on. So the idea for giving this as a start is, you know, to make them relax and play around having, you know, gamified type of activity and you know, making it more enjoyable. No answers are wrong, no answers are uh, also uh, right if it is not backed up with evidence. So the idea is to teach them and train them to look from different perspectives and later to provide evidence and data when they say something. This is very important to be taught and trained uh, in your class, I think. And Another alternative for this is you can also give a simple case like this, a small uh, uh, story or case, for example, like this. Uh, a treasure hunter was going to explore a cave up on a hill near a beach. He suspected there might be many parts inside the, 
uh, the way there, and so on and so on. So basically, you try to uh, make them think, yeah, make them, them think into uh, an open, what is that uh, type of question? And the answers can be very multiple, but then again, why they answer that kind of thing. So there are so many ways to teach them. Now, if I, for example, would like to teach about something related to astronomy or universe and so on, I can start with this. If the topic, for example, is about planets, I can ask my students like this. What do you think in this, of this picture? Uh, or what do you see? Whatever they want to answer, then they can answer. I can see, I, I, I saw rainbow. And then I, I don't say anything, I don't see anything. And then I, I help them by giving this uh, arrow and focusing on this small dot. And later, this can take some time if you have time, but as a model, I just try to go through this quickly. So I'm teaching them how to look from specific details and also sometimes from general point of view. So by giving this arrow, I'm teaching them that this is actually Earth. And it is very small. And imagine how small we are in the universe. So using this as our, uh, my start of lesson, I can then ask them to watch a video about Mars exploration. You can give the YouTube link. If it is not possible, you can download the video first and then send through WhatsApp if it is uh, about the connection. Then while you ask the students to watch videos, you can also ask them to do several activities at the same time to help them watching. Yeah, otherwise they just watch and they don't know what part to focus. For example, you can ask them to do not taking a particular context. You can also give guided questions. Yeah. And then after that, I will direct them to, to use other things. This is called virtual reality. So uh, with Google, for example, with google.com already provide a lot of materials. And then if it is about Mars, I can uh, give them experience to explore Mars as curiosity rovers. So if the internet is okay with you, you can play around with this. Everything is free, all right? So basically you, uh, you know, go around Mars and then try to uh, learn about the paths and so on and so on. You can also use YouTube, 360 videos. Yeah, not, not only uh, artificial intelligence from with Google. So there are a lot of 360 videos virtual base, reality base uh, available in YouTube. One of them is about Mars like this. You can also go to 360 cities. Yeah, one of them is about Mars and other planets. So basically you can use uh, Google Glass. If not, you don't have to use it. Well, this is only example. If you cannot uh, do this due to connection, uh, gadgets and so on, you don't have to. You can use picture. You can use even door-to-door uh, -door activity because there is no internet. So the idea is give something interesting to them and also provoking their thinking. Yeah, something new, something unique, and you know, provided with guided uh, activities. Then you can ask them questions using different types of quiz. If you like to do using Kahoot, you use that one. If you like to use quizzes, you use that one. If you like to do Mentimeter or Menti, you can use Menti or WhatsApp uh, question, uh, you know, answering question type of thing. And then I will, I can ask them to go to this uh, Thingling activity. So I already provide uh, some materials here, A, B, and C, and D, where they can click that one based on their groups, for example. So I divided the class into four groups uh, group A uh, will be looking uh, on spirit, group B will be looking uh, on Phoenix, C will be looking at opportunity, and D will be looking at something different, the future of Mars, for example. And while they are watching or uh, looking at this thingling, uh, virtual reality image base, you can also have video here, and it is free. 
you can play around, try to give quizzes in the middle if you want, or a type of formative. Or you can ask also them to go to Padlet or to WhatsApp to do discussion. So there are various rich activities that can involve here. First, you can ask them to do an alone uh, activity like browsing. Then you can ask them to do a small group discussion. Then you can also ask them to do thing per se. You can also ask them to do whole group discussion. You can ask them to create mind map to finalize their thoughts from the discussion available in a particular platform, for example. And the way you do it, you can also modify this into a rotation station type of activity where different groups have different activities at the same time and they rotate themselves to check into each other and to contribute there. So these are main activities that you can do. The platforms, the tools, whatever, works with your situation. If it is low cost, no, not very good internet, you can use WhatsApp. If there is no internet at all, you can volunteer yourself to do, uh, for example, using TV, TVRI or uh, radio, like Radio Republic Indonesia, for example, or even you go door to door. It is not easy, but we have to do this. If the internet is better, you can use Padlet like this. Yeah, You design different groups and then different groups will comment and contribute their thoughts into their Padlet's group. And the, every group can do a virtual rotation station by looking at the other group's uh, comments and ideas and give some thoughts on that one. And if you use a learning management system like Moodle or other things, you can use discussion forum there. So after they do a lot of discussion, watching videos, guided questions from browsing uh, alone, uh, think per se, small group, whole class, and so on and so on, you can give them a, a project to do. For example, I start with, if I'm Elon Musk, what will you do? So you can ask them, to create a project, for example, an interview project. So, or you can change this Elon into astronaut. If I am an astronaut, what will you do? Or what will you say or do, uh, create and so on. So the different activities can be set up here from interview, making a story, making a podcast, vlog, uh, role play and so on and so on. So different projects to cater mixed ability class, okay? Don't forget assessment, all right? So there are some alternatives. If you want them to create comic, for example, you can uh, give example like this and uh, direct them to some comic maker platform, for example. Don't forget the assessment to assess learning media like comic or story. You can also ask them to do a different project. For example, high achiever students, they can work on infographics. You have to mention and explain a bit about this. Uh, and you can also share tools and platforms to create infographics for free, okay? And believe me, your students will be much better in using technologies than you, if it is okay for your situation. For example, this is using Canva, this is using Genially, all right? Don't forget the assessment for infographics specifically. I already read some questions about how to assess assessment and so on. When you assess, uh, focus on the dimensions of learning that you aim. Yeah, for example, if it is in infographics, you focus on content, visual mechanics and so on. How about validity? Use already valid uh, measurements. If you modify as the theory of validity and reliability says, you have to do expert judge, for example, to make it fast. Uh, to make it valid, all right? Other activities may include news reporter uh, type of thing, using screencasting project, for example, that is uh, asking them to record the, the screen, yeah? For example, using screencast automatic, QuickTime, Camtasia, Mobizen, if it is smartphone, and then edit it with Quick, KindMaster, iMovie, whatever they can do. Can, do, can they use different things? Yes, but you have to give them options. Yeah, because not our students, even though they are Gen Z, know how to use um, 
uh, technologies effectively. Don't forget the assessment. All right. What I can conclude from this is, is actually, uh, whatever the tools that you use, it doesn't matter. You have to focus on the pedagogy, yeah? And integrate the expertise from the content and also the use of relevant tools to make it meaningful and effective. You can use so many tools there, yeah? But then which one is more relevant to your situation and your need? You don't have to use very sophisticated thing if it doesn't work with your situation. But the aim is to help your students achieve the learning objectives. So what I model just now is actually a part of this kind of uh, big framework. It's called uh, project-based or PLUS model. So in project-based, you uh, shift your learning into student-centered. It is more fun, engaging, collaborative at the same way and inquiry-based, based on questions. It is also active learning. It is also helping them to understand the topic of solar system, for example, the one that I give example just now. And it also give opportunity for them to display their understanding of the content. Uh, there are also some other frameworks, for example, the use of TPAC. Uh, we can talk about this later, but the idea is that you understand the content you know how to deliver the content and you can integrate with relevant tools. So here in the middle is your point. Of course, don't forget the context, for example, internet connection, geolocation, facilities, readiness, acceptance of the technologies and many things. There are also other frameworks called summer model from Putandura. So basically whether you are going to use technologies as substitution only or uh, into something tra transformative, yeah? Uh, there are some other models called RED, like um, uh, re re replication and then amplifying and transformation, which is similar to summer and pick RED also, whether you aim the students to be passive, interactive or creative using RED model. There is also other frameworks called UTAUT, use of technologies and uh, technology accept, uh, use, yeah, acceptance and use of technologies. So, uh, you when you use technologies, think about whether the students and you yourself accept and then use the technologies themselves. Okay, focus on those things when you deliver materials. So, what we have learned today: first, what happens today in our learning context; second. You have to equip yourself with concepts, pedagogies, and skills and competencies in online learning, where the content must be chunk, okay, part by part, bit by bit, unbundled. You have to open everything into scaffolded activities. Scaffolded means step by step, part by part, section by section, in a flowing manner. And don't forget, to make them learning and to avoid, for example, there is a question of cheating or copying and pasting, you have to make your lesson personalized. Then they can use their personal opinions or even understanding about a particular context. You, we also learn about how to engage our students from, diff, uh, uh, from different points of view. You can flip your class, but today, the flip learning doesn't mean that it is in class, but the class must be virtual. You can gamify your learning also. As Andrew and Adrian mentioned just now, you can differentiate your learning. Yeah, uh, differentiation means that you focus on content, process, and product based on their, the students' needs and profiles and also readiness. So for example, like what I did, uh, what I did just now, I differentiate in terms of product. One group, for example, create video, one group create comic, uh, story, uh, news uh, making, and so on and so on. You, we also learn how to effectively integrate all the components of effective learning, flexible new learning. Don't forget, we also for, uh, learn about assessment and feedback. Okay? In the end, our aim is to help our students to provide the rooms for them to be creative, to have opportunities to think so they can feel that their learning is meaningful 
Why? Because after that, they will go to the uh, working uh, industry, real world, and when they understand learning meaningfully in whatever condition, they can take part quite effectively. It is different when they memorize things. Okay. And again, the idea of uh, education is not only focusing on the brain only, like cognitive. It doesn't mean that those who get higher, high GPA, for example, or score can also be a good human being. So you have to think of the affective side, like character and so on. And also you can sometimes make them uh, do something, exercise, right? So again, the idea of education today is the same. You help them to understand things. You help them, you help them to be, uh, uh, what is that, uh, also skillful and also uh, have the understanding on what is needed in the global context, like the forces, communication, collaboration, and so on. And even if I use Fullens model, it is now four, uh, six years involving sophisticated technologies if your situation doesn't allow. The red one means that your internet connection is good and it is needed to do uh, at that time, immediately, like today. But then if it is green, for example, when it is low immediacy and low bandwidth, you can just pre-record your material, for example, using videos or send the materials or photos using WhatsApp and then students can respond in a week, for example, asynchronously. So, Again, it is not the technologies, but how you use those tools because technologies integration and meaningful learning is actually a critical approach of pedagogies, which is determinist approach and tools, which is instrumental approach. So you must be here. This is my references that you can look later on and thank you very much. So I've written this to but maybe. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Made, for the fascinating uh, presentation. We surely learned a lot from your session, and also Adrian and Andrew's session. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to proceed to the Q and A session. There are so many questions here for the presenters, uh, so let's address some of them. Um, here, I have noted several interesting questions from the audience. And I would like to ask the first question to Adrian and Andrew, because this is related to your session. Uh, it seems that people are quite interested in how AI can be implemented in online learning. Can you please elaborate more on the use of AI, artificial intelligence in online learning? Uh, this is gonna become very interesting when um, we're able to do tasks which seem quite simple, um, but use AI. So a lovely example, for instance, would be if you were able to have a conversation with a uh, Google Assistant or Alexa or Siri and do something like book a table at a restaurant or order some flowers or even play your favorite music. Um, at the moment, most of those don't quite let you have a conversation, but it's getting very close. And that will be a lovely task um, that uses AI, uh, that is provided by these tech giants that is completely accessible uh, to all of us. Um, we're, we're always looking at things like, how can you sort of simulate late a little WhatsApp conversation where you're typing and getting some response. And I think that's what AI will be very nice at helping us with in classrooms is uh, giving little responses, um, not huge things, but like that. So um, can I ask you, Adrian, do you think that AI will be able to save teachers time in the future, for example, by um, marking essays or, or, or written work? And been, I know there have been a lot of questions about writing. What's the role of AI in writing? I, I think certainly for the foreseeable future, it's, it's more of a donkey role so that maybe you, your students will write an essay uh, on a web page, submit it, 
Um, and then when you get it, there will be certain areas perhaps already highlighted by an AI marking system that will help you focus. But my guess is that you'll still be uh, giving much of the feedback, but it's an extra tool to make it easier for you to save you time. Right. Can I add something on that, uh, Andrew? Please. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, it's, it's true that uh, AI uh, can help us uh, in a way, but then uh, sometimes uh, pro ethics from problems also coming up. So to use AI more effectively, I think, for example, uh, there is uh, AI experiments uh, with Google uh, from uh, Semantris, for example. One of the AI tool is called Semantris, where students can learn vocabularies while playing games at the same time, like Tetris. So they have to, you know, uh, think about thematic words uh, in a Tetris type of uh, game, and then they can have fun with that. Uh, in a higher level, I think you can use essay bot for, you know, advanced students, not to help them to create articles, because essay bot can help you to create a 15 pages article with references, but then, you can ask AI like Essaybot to create an article and then ask your students to critically review the quality of writing made by Essaybot. That will you know, help students to, to uh, train their critical thinking or critical reading activity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pak Made, Andrew and Adrian. Uh, for the second question, I would like to ask this to Pak Made, Pak Heri. Yes. So <clears throat> many teachers uh, wonder how to motivate their students, especially students who already have very low level of motivation, even in the yeah. offline class. Okay, so do you have any particular suggestion for that? Yes, Ma Mimi, thank you very much. Well, motivation is an interesting issue all the time. A simple uh, formula for motivation is that people will do something when they feel that there is a benefit for them uh, to do that. So in my case, for example, I asked my students to do a digital story project, and then I always help them, facilitate them uh, throughout the process. And then at the end, I talk to them that your digital story will be published, okay? So you will have something as something, you know, a reward for you. So that way can help to motivate them to learn. So you have to show uh, the benefits and the uniqueness of your, uh, of your activity or project. Okay, thank you. I think that's all. Yeah. Can I add something? Sure. Yes. Yeah, Please. so I, I mean, I think we, we can't um, put our expectations We've got to be realistic in our expectations in the sense that we all know that in a typical class we'll have 10 percent of students who are super keen we'll have 10 percent of students who who really are, are not interested and then we'll have the, the bulk of the students who are um who, who work who work well um so we're not going to expect that that low 10%, 10% who really have very little motivation in the first place. We're not going to expect great things of them in this situation. And then also, of course, you know, it's, it is a tough time. We do need to be aware that, you know, a student's been, they're, they're young, full of energy. They've been sitting indoors um, for however many weeks it is. So I think we have to also, we have to keep, we have to keep that in mind as well. We have to keep the human element in mind. And um, I think, Harry was absolutely right in what he was talking about the effective elements um, at the beginning of the talk. And finally, I mean, I think um, one of the things that can work well is group work, because there you have um, your, um, you can tap into group motivation. So it's not just that I'm sitting here feeling that I really can't be bothered to do this piece of work. It's that if I really can't be bothered with it, then I'm letting him down as well. I'm letting him. And they're also putting pressure on me to do my bit. So that's, yeah. So, so I think we can, we, can look at, we can look at motivation in those different ways. Okay. Um, so there's also a more specific question 
while this is somewhat related to motivation still, um, when it comes to teaching children or young learners in this challenging situation, um, what will be the best practice then? Because uh, probably like kindergartners or elementary uh, students, they tend to appreciate face-to-face -face interaction with their teachers, with their friends, while this time they have to stay at home and then only rely on uh, their cell phone or their laptop. So do you have any suggestions for the teachers? This yes, can be... uh, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, uh, I think it is a very interesting uh, issue also to be addressed. Uh, the idea of young learners uh, teaching is quite different to adults, for example. So again, uh, teachers must try to make it meaningful and fun at the same way. Uh, one uh, idea that I can think of is that to involve the parents together. So because it is for young learners, uh, you can ask the students to uh, interview in a way or ask questions to their parents or their siblings, for example, uh, about a particular topic. For example, how to how how does a rainbow happen, for example. So something real in their life or why uh, there is a lamp on and off, why the TV is on and so on. So using the, you know, realia, contextual and authentic uh, uh, in their surroundings and then by also involving the others uh, while the teachers are facilitating uh, I think that can be a good way and at the end try to ask the students to show their understanding for example by coloring something I, I develop a, a virtual reality based uh, Android application at the moment one of them is uh, about animals in Indonesia called animals of Nusantara and then I already published a book called Animals of Nusantara Coloring Book. This is for young learners. So basically using virtual reality, they look for animals, different types of animals, endemic animals. And then at the end, they do uh, further activities like coloring uh, as simple as that or, you know, spelling. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to respond to this question also, Adrian and Andrew? Uh, yes, I, uh, really this is more of uh, an experience rather than uh, uh, advice. My, my daughter's in elementary school and the days where she's had the most successful um, or she's felt she's got the most out of the online learning have been the ones where the teacher has kind of stuck to the normal school day. They, there have been snack time, there's been lunch time, there's been play time. Um, where they've perhaps even been encouraged to play um, computer games or talk to each other. And um, the teacher may not be on video all the time, but at the beginning of every lesson, the teacher is there for people who want to join in. So that there is still at least the face, even if you can't call it face to face. And at the end of the day, there's the feeling, right, you've done your whole school day. Now you can switch off and go out and play and that that seems to have worked particularly well for the younger ones okay all right thank you very much um another popular question is assessment okay uh especially when it comes to assessing uh speaking so <clears throat> how would you like to comment on that issue what uh, are the best ways to assess uh, students, especially in speaking skills? Right. Should, I, should I kick off? Sure. Okay, I mean, it's, yeah. speaking's, a, speaking's a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, you know, it, it always seems, I mean, everything we're doing is mediated by technology at the moment. And it always seems to me that in, in language teaching, technology has a role to play, but it's never, it's never the full answer. And um, it always seems to me, for example, that in, if you're using online resources or, or you know, any sort of technology for learning um, grammar, that's very, that can be very useful. Vocabulary, that can be very useful. Um, listening and reading, that can be very useful. Listening and reading are things we do anyway using technology. That's what we, that's what we do on our phones. 
speaking, um, Adrian was talking earlier about, I mean, uh, AI for marking speaking, it's quite primitive. You know, you can set up a genuine task. Okay, you need to book a restaurant. Um, you're going with a friend, you're going, you want this kind of food at this particular time on this particular day. You can do a real test. There. You can actually, I mean, you have to cancel it afterwards, <laughs> but you can actually get through and you can go through a, um, an AI system, a genuine real AI system, and you can complete a real task. If you're asking someone to do an IELTS type um, speaking assessment where you're interacting with another human being, they're interacting with you, um, you're giving a talk um, and you're answering questions which come from the things that you said in that talk, then it seems to me that you need to have another, another person there to do mm -hmm. it. And of course, you know, you, you can do that through, you can do that, we're, we're listening to each other now and talking to each other or you can do it through Skype and I think I think if I'm not mistaken I think there are I think if there are other IELTS speaking tests through Skype at the moment I mean, I think that's yes. the way you know they've, they've put the rest of it um, online um, machine marked I think certainly the, the reading and the listening but the speaking is still face to face except over Skype and I think that's you know that's the right decision Okay. Would you like to add some comments, Paheri? Yes, um, that's that's great uh, idea also suggestion from Andrew just now. So uh, yes, the idea of group work and also AI as machine automation can be also be uh, used or implemented there. Uh, other than that, uh, again, when you do something, uh, remember the pedagogy or revisit your pedagogy. What is the learning objective for that speaking uh, lesson? Uh, are you looking at, for example, the ability to do public speaking? So the way you assess will be different. Are you looking at their ability to perform dialogues or role play with friends or peers? The way you, you assess their speaking will be different. And are you looking at particular content, for example, or, or topic? The way you assess will also be different. So go back to your learning objective and pedagogy. Uh, for example, you are looking at the, uh, how your students can perform presentation about, uh, let's say, uh, robots in the industrial world, for example. And then you can help them to look for materials and discussion, again, with various, various activities, meaningful activities. And at the end, you can ask one of the project is to perform in front of the uh, class or, or virtually now. Uh, you can also involve ORI, for example, A -R, uh, AI, oh, sorry, o -R -A -I, ORI for an, uh, an artificial intelligence uh, app for helping public speaking. So it gives you like seven days now. In the past, it's, it's like more. But it's good because ORI will tell you where you, for example, have gaps or fillers, whether your talking or your speaking is too fast, what happens to your energy, for example, and so on, things like that. But again, because it is machine, you cannot rely. You have to have personal touch, facial expression, eye contact, and so on and so on. So to assess speaking again, go back to your objective and use uh, rubrics, for example, to help you. The rubrics can be obtained from Google or you can create yourself from RubyStar, uh, any types of uh, online rubrics tools. And then, you know, you have uh, very complete ways to assess your students' ability. Thank you. Okay. Speaking about um, constructing a rubric, there is also this particular question that is um, interesting. How do we as teachers construct a rubric that is not one size fits all, that treats students with equity during this online learning uh, condition? Who would Andrew, like to answer that? Uh, right, yeah, so, so, yeah. so please. Sorry. Please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Andrew, Andrew first. Well, with rubric, do you mean, when you say rubric, do you, you will talk about instructions for particular activities. Yeah, it's so, like. Right? Um, a tool to assess students' performance, right? So yes. uh, I think this 
teacher would like to know how to assess students when perhaps the backgrounds of the students can be different in terms of infrastructure and then also abilities and then yeah yeah i mean obviously the uh the technology if, you, if we're talking about online assessment um then uh the, this is where fairness comes in and that um teachers uh, students all have to be treated fairly so if i'm doing something on an old nokia phone and um the person next door to me has a brand new Apple, Apple uh, full screen yeah. computer, then, then that's not fair. So, so I think, so we need to be, we as teachers need to be aware of that. And we need to devise test items that are not going to disadvantage some question, some students over the other. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about this, this whole thing about Sometimes you might have to go door to door and deliver your then deliver your question and then and then get them to bring it back the next day if that's if that's the only fair way of doing it. Adrian, you know, you know about fairness. Well, if, for instance, when when we were looking at our placement test, um, which is obviously sort of a tool for very much at the beginning of a, a course, um, we did a lot of analysis looking at. Um, could people answer the type of questions, you know, especially ones that involve dragging, sentence ordering, or things like that. If you were on a phone, if you're on an old phone, if you're on a computer, did it impact the fairness? Um, and the good thing about things being online is you can easily collect a lot of data. Um, and we found that so long as you keep the question types uh, treat them carefully, then there is no impact on fairness of uh, a fast internet, of uh, a slow internet, of small device, big device, for something like a placement test. I mean, if you're watching uh, videos, it, it, it might be quite different. Can I add? You're by Harry. Yes, uh, I agree to what Adrian and Andrew said just now. So fairness is very important also that your rubric or assessment must be fair to all types of students. So again, if you talk about rubric, you are talking about assessing students, the way you assess students. There are so many ways. One of them is using rubric. If you, for example, looking at performance type of uh, activity, for example, speaking and writing. When you talk about assessment, then there must be principles that you must follow. Fairness has been mentioned just now. Other than that, uh, validity, whether your, your instrument or rubric are valid, whether it is really measuring what it should measure, for example. Yeah, uh, reliability, for example, whether it is consistent. Uh, transparency, for example. Uh, uh, for example, other things like uh, backwash also, whether the impact. So think about this, that is the first. The second one, you don't have to use tools uh, like uh, Ruby Star, but if you can and it allows you to do that, use it because it helps you a lot. There has been so many examples there. You can modify uh, to suit your needs. But again, whatever you do, uh, your rubric must assess what it should assess and it helps students to uh, understand the materials and achieve the learning objectives as I mentioned earlier. So when you practice and try out something, whatever it is, uh, including tools for learning, tools for assessment and so on, don't forget to reflect at the end of the lesson. Reflection is very important because what we share today doesn't mean will work best in your con condition or situation. You have to reflect and if it doesn't work, try to modify to suit your situation. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Now, there is also this question that um, has been asked by many teachers. It's about students who don't have gadgets and cannot afford uh, internet connection. In this uh, situation, it seems that they are very vital. So how can we teach if our students mostly cannot afford those two things? 
Yes, this is uh, this is one big issue, especially also in, in in many parts of the world, I think, and including in Bali and Indonesia. So a simple answer: don't use it. You cannot force. Yeah. Again, go back to your the way you try to uh, make your learning effective and meaningful. So one case in Indonesia, even a teacher go door to door to address uh, his uh, students because of his commitment, you know. But if you can use uh, something low, for example, like WhatsApp, WhatsApp is very popular in Indonesia. You can utilize this one too. I use WhatsApp now because I try to address this kind of issue. Again, technology is only a tool, Ibu Bapa and uh, colleagues, friends and colleagues. They are only medium or media to help you to achieve something. So use relevant ones, suit it to your condition and context and reflect at the end. Thank you. Anything else, Adrian and Andrew? Well, obviously no? this is, I mean, this is a, 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 a very, very important question because um, this is, you know, if you, if you take away a, a, a six months or a year of education from the poorest people who are the most disadvantaged anyway, um, and then you have the, um, the more well-off students who are in any way advantaged um, and who have the uh, technology that they need to, 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 to do online classes, then uh, you've, got a big, you're, you've, got, you've got an even worse problem at the end of it. So, you know, it's not, uh, it's not easy, but it's, um, it's going to have to be a very community-based thing. And communities, you know, it's the communities that have to the teachers and the communities that have to work that out. Okay, yeah, it is a very <laughs> tricky situation indeed, yeah? yeah. Especially, if, let's say, uh, in one house, there are three uh, children, they all need <laughs> gadgets, yeah. and the parents can only yeah. afford one or two. Mm. Yeah. Yes, true. Okay, um, probably this is the last question. This is from teacher educators, I guess. Um, what are the best ways or strategies to teach micro teaching subject where usually yeah, the students have to teach right in front of students and how can we do that? Yeah, this is definitely the last question due to the time limit. <laughs> Who would like to address yes, this? Um, this is one of the courses in, in yeah. my department actually. Uh -huh. So if you are teaching in teacher training uh, institution, micro teaching is one of the subjects. And we are also still thinking of how to deal with the situation because you need to, what we, what, we, what we are doing at the moment is before this, we always uh, divide our class, uh, our students in one class into smaller groups. So normally one class in my situation consists of around 30 students. It's a big number actually. Uh, but then when it, uh, with like 10 parallel classes, so it's like 251 cohort. So all these 250, around 200 something, will take micro teaching at the same time. The problem with this, with this is before pandemic is number of uh, you know, students in one class and facilities. Facilities is the big problem. So that's why we divide into smaller groups so everyone can use the micro teaching room uh, for practicing. Uh, in this pandemic, uh, we are what we are doing now is using platform, online platforms like this. If again uh, your internet is okay, you can use Zoom or Meet or whatever you uh, feel comfortable with. If not, uh, I think you have to think about that, and we have to think about this all together also, and try to involve teachers uh, from schools and also using a, a, low, a more low tech uh, technologies uh, like WhatsApp. Uh, it can be done synchronously uh, or asynchronously. Facebook is also good, I think. Facebook already upgraded video into 50 members for one type of session. I think it's good. WhatsApp is also upgrading into eight. So I think it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Paheri. Um, okay, so I'm afraid this is uh, the end of the Q&A session. So far, we have uh, tried to address most of the common questions from the audience. 
but it's time for us to uh, close this webinar, okay? We have come to the end of this webinar, but before I close this webinar, let me remind you the arrangement for the webinar material, certificate, and survey form. Uh, participants, please uh, complete the survey form to get a certificate and webinar presentation slides. Um, yes, for clarity, can you please show the survey page? Okay. Yes, so this is the link. Please go to bit.ly slash Teflin PDP survey. And once you have completed the form, then you will receive your webinar materials and a certificate within seven working days. So <clears throat> once again, I would like to uh, appreciate Andrew, Adrian, and Pa Heri, who have delivered very uh, useful materials and share their knowledge, uh, especially from Adrian and Andrew, who have shared the importance of classroom management, and then Pa Heri, who reminded us uh, how we all need to go back to the principles yeah, uh, of effective online pedagogy and skills and to make sure that the learning is meaningful. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for your participation in this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you again at another professional development program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Andrew. Adrian. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.